Hello friends, welcome to the second lecture and in this lecture we are considering the topic evolution of living organisms. Our main objectives for this lecture is to look at the various definitions of life, trying to look at both the Christian, Muslim uh, and to some extent the scientific definition of how life started. And then we would look at the question whether life is possible on all planets. You may have heard of different planets, uh, from the basic nine planets we know from basic school, to other new planets or what you call exoplanets, which have been discovered over a period of time. So we'll understand this question, is life possible? And based on that, we try to answer this question about what makes life possible, the conditions required to support life on a planet and we take a few measurements on what scientists have proposed to be very important indicators of life and life support on this planet and exoplanet. Then we also go on to look at the various accounts on the origin of life. Scientists, um, the religious groups have all proposed how life has or how life evolved or how life came to being. And we'll observe that in the various definitions of Christian and Muslim point of view, they are all based on supernatural powers, all based on their belief in a supernatural God, which you know may not be able to be uh, evaluated with science. So we look at other scientific views of how life originated. And we will end by looking at the simplest structure in which life was formed and try to understand whether this was possible based on the views proposed by scientists to explain the origin of life. So to begin, let's look at the various uh, views on life. I want to understand and define what life itself. So we have to appreciate that one, life should be capable of three things. It should be capable of self-sustenance, replication, and also mutation. So anything has, if anything has life, that life form should be able to sustain itself. It should be able to reproduce or replicate. And that life form should be able to undergo some level of mutation or changes in its system that will make it survive more in its environment. So the self-sustainment ensure that there is some degree of damage or loss of material which may occur, but it should be made up for by the sustenance ability of this life form. With replication, we need to ensure that there is continuity of life and that that life form doesn't become extinct. And for mutation, it should permit the emergency of progenies that change under the pressure of natural selection in order to compete efficiently for matter and energy in an increasingly uh, changing environment. So if you are called to have a life, you must be able to perpetuate these three properties. Other definitions of life are so sought to see what life does, and this includes the fact that life is a characteristic that distinguish physical entities having biological processes. And if you remember, Mrs. Green, the life, seven life processes, that's what we are talking about. But here, we want to emphasize that life should have these processes, including signaling and self-sustaining processes. That makes it different from those that either once upon had this life activity but ceased, or those that may have never had such function at all. So, we know that there are various life forms exist, including plants, animals. We know about fungi, prototests, archaea, and also bacteria. And I'm sure you know about the classification of organisms into these kingdoms. Other definitions say that organisms to have life should have or should maintain homeostasis. They should be composed of cells. They must undergo metabolism. They should grow, adapt to the environment, respond to stimuli, and also reproduce. So you see the seven life forms, uh, the seven life processes uh, come in here. Then we can say that you have life. Other scientists have also viewed life as a living system. And you know what a system is? A system is anything that interacts with its environment, either by the exchange of both energy and also matter. So you see life systems are open systems, they are self-organizing and they are also interacting with the environment. And this involves the flow of information, the flow of energy, and also matter. So scientists have proposed that uh, a general living system theory is really needed to explain the nature of life. 
And you bear with me that in our current human form, we exchange information with the environment. We exchange energy. We exchange matter. So it proves the theory where we are viewing life as a living system uh, other than those previous definitions that we talked about. And one principle that has explained, or one hypothesis that has explained life as a system is what you call the Gaia hypothesis. Uh, and this is also known as the Gaia theory or the Gaia principle and proposes that organisms interact with their inorganic surroundings on Earth to form a synergistic, self-regulating complex system that helps to maintain and perpetuate the conditions for life on this planet. And this is very important because this guy hypothesis just makes us understand that every living form is affected by what goes on in the environment. And it's very important to appreciate that excessive pollution in the environment, excessive poll pollution of water, our soil, our air, always comes back to influence these living systems on Earth. And it's very important that we save our planet because based on this uh, theory, everything that's going on in our environment seeks to influence, whether positively or negatively, to the life forms on it. Other scientists have also viewed life not just as a system, but as a complex system. And this has evolved into an aspect of biology uh, called the complex systems biology. So this area of complex system biology uh, has been seen as a branch or a subfield of both mathematics and biology. And they are concerned with the complexity of both structure and function in biological systems, as well as the emergency and evolution of organisms and species, placing emphasis on the complex interaction of or within uh, bio networks and also on the fundamental relations and relational patterns that are very essential for life. So this model or this branch of biology has really come to add more impetus to the fact that life is not as simple as we see it, but it's a complex interrelation of various aspects, both within the organism and also in the environment of the organism. So next, we want to answer this question. Is life possible on all planets? And we'll discuss more of this in class. But the question is, Life does not occur on all. The answer is life does not occur on all planets. And it will only occur when certain conditions that support life are met. And you can just mention some of these. We need the right moisture in the form of water. And water must exist in the liquid form, not in the ice, not in the any gaseous form, which may not be useful to living things. It must be in the liquid form. We need air. And this, we are not just talking about any air. We are talking about air that is particularly rich in oxygen that can support uh, 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 aerobic systems, including you and I. And I also need just the right temperature, not too cold, not too hot, just the right habitable uh, temperature so that life can uh, survive. Of course, there will be light, perhaps because it may be closer or further to the sun, but these three conditions are very, very important into proposing anything that you think can't support life. So scientists have generated what is called the habitable zones in the Milky Way, where we have seen conditions just to be right in this zone colored green. So you see that the zones which are colored red are very close to the sun, and the sun being the source of light, the source of heat, will make planets existing in this zone just too hot uh, for life to exist. And you don't forget that if it's just too hot, it means that water cannot exist in the liquid, but in the gaseous form, the temperatures will be too much for the survival of life forms. If you are going beyond this green zone and looking at this blue zone, it is further away from the sun, and therefore temperature will just be too cold also to uh, not make water exist in the uh, liquid, but rather in the solid state, and may not also be able to support life. But any planet that is found within this green zone has been found to be just right to support life. And our planet, which is Earth, is just within this zone. And that is why we are able to survive on this Earth. And that is why even on the surface of the Earth, temperatures are not the same. Some places are cold. Some places are very warm. For example, those of us in the tropics, very warm. Those in the Arctic and the Antarctic, very cold. But 
irrespective, there is a right temperature. There is air, oxygen abound, and that is able to support life just within this form. And therefore, uh, somewhere in the year 2013, scientists at NASA commissioned um, a form of space exploration called the Kepler mission. And that mission detected and reported a few planets, which they call exoplanets, that would just are also found in this uh, habitable zone that will be able to support life uh, to some extent. So looking at our Earth, right in that zone, these other uh, planets called the Kepler 62 systems have also been detected. So the Kepler 62, F 62, E, the D, the C, and the B have all been found within this uh, habitable zone, particularly the 62, F and the 62, E. And research is still being done to see if life can really exist. Indeed, in some of the things we see in the movies, uh, we may think they are truly false. But indeed, there are exploration going on where other life forms, for example, apes, have been sent to some of these planets and they are measuring their habitability or they are able to survive in those environments. And scientists are really considering uh, moving there, perhaps in the near future. But there are a few measurements which we need to know that actually supports life. So scientists have been able to measure what is called the habitable zone, where you should be as close to zero as possible, but you can get to plus one or you can get to minus one. So this zone measures how far an exoplanet from the center of the star's habitable zone uh, and it is measured in what we call the habitable zone unit. And planets inside this habitable zone have values between minus 1 and plus 1, with 0 being the exact center, negative and positive values corresponding to locations either close or further away to the stars, uh, respectively. Now, this habitable zone uh, distance has been shown to be a function of the star's luminosity as well as temperature and also the planet distance within this habitable zone. There is also what is called the primary standard habitability, SPH. And this measures the thermal water climate sustainability of a planet for land primary producers, that is plants, measured from a scale of 0 to 1, with 1 being the most habitable. Now, planets with this mean global surface temperature close to 25 degrees Celsius will have an SP equal to 1, and those below minus 10 and above 50 will become somehow non-habitable. And it's also a function of both the surface temperature and relative humidity, but only the temperature component is calculated for exoplanets, and it's assumed that water is present. Again, in this diagram, you look at our Earth, scientists believe some 500 years ago, was close to one, making it very or excellently habitable. But our Earth today is about 0 0.7 habitable, meaning that we, you and I, have primarily contributed to making the Earth less habitable with pollution from factories, domestic waste, industrial waste, excessive burning, increasing the carbon dioxide concentration, which we what we know as the global warming. And that is the effect we are seeing now when it even rains in December in Ghana, rains in January, where we usually we experience cold and dry weather. Something is changing. And that changes are making those changes are making our earth less habitable. And therefore, you and I have a responsibility to reduce pollution and improve the habitability on Earth. So this slide shows some selected potential habitable exoplanets that have been discovered uh, between 2010 and 2012. And 
we are measuring the uh, potential habitability with an index called the earth similarity index. What we are doing is that we are assuming earth is a perfect planet that can support every life form. So we compare these planets with earth. So earth is set as let's say 100% and all the others are measured against it. So we'll begin with mass. The planet mass has this index of 0 0.64 which means that compared to earth Mass can support life up to about 60% of what Earth can do. But these few other um, exoplanets, beginning with the glass 581J, which is a planet candidate, has been support, has been shown to be very similar to that of Earth, to about 82% uh, in supporting life. Other few ones which were recently excluded has also been shown. So next, we want to discuss the various views on the origin of life. Earth supports life. Other planets have been shown to be able to possibly support life. But the begging question is, how did those life evolve? So we begin with a special creation, which is postulated by Christians, Muslims, and a traditional viewpoint based on our belief in God. And this creation says that life is so complex that it required a supernatural force to generate it. So in the Christian, Muslim, and the other uh, God-believing, special-believing hypothesis or belief, we say that the life we have is very complex and that it takes only a special person, that supernatural force to generate it. But the problem is, scientists don't believe this and they see it as mystical and because it cannot be proven. Right? Then we talk about the colonization theory, also called the theory of panspermia. This theory proposes that life may have arisen from other life forms that came from elsewhere in the universe. So some scientists believe that the life we have on Earth now could possibly have existed on other planets and they were brought to earth by some special force. They were driven to earth by some special force. Uh, and there's even science that supports that uh, life in the form of living spores. I know that some microorganisms generate life forms through spores. So they believe that life in the form of living spores may have been driven to our earth by some special forces. Or they have come to earth by the movement of stars from other planetary systems. And other scientists like Francis Crick and Leslie Ogel propose that the transport of life from elsewhere might have been driven by some intelligent forces. So it goes back to the Christian and Muslim belief of the supernatural force. What is that intelligent force that drove these life forms onto our earth now? So there is also a begging issue of how this can be proven or rectified. The panspermia theory also suggests that life seeds came from outer space and planets. And this literally means that, panspermia literally means that it's life uh, seeds from elsewhere. And this suggests life, that life could have existed on another planet and moved to Earth. And statistics shows that 7.5% of rocks that came from Mars reach Earth. And these rocks would have traveled between less than 100 to 116,000 years or more before it got to Earth. Now, thinking about the hot atmospheres between these two planets, the Mars and the Earth, we could also argue that it's possible these life forms could have died even before they reached Earth, and therefore it begs for more uh, scientific evidence to prove this. Some other proponents, including Sales Guion de Montevant, who proposed life came from moon, and H. E. Pichta also suggested that life came from meteorites and comets. And we also have Svavanti um, Arenas, who also came up with the final theory of panspermia. There has been some evidence to support the fact that this theory of panspermia could be true. Because it's proving that some bacteria can survive harsh environments of space. 
So if I'm talking about high temperature, I'm talking about extreme cold, I'm talking about UV radiations, some bacteria can survive that. So it's possible that the life was actually found on those comets and they were able to survive all the many years and the harsh conditions and arrived on Earth. Evidence has also suggested that some meteorites actually contain life forms. There were remnants of bacteria, uh, what do you call amino acids. They were found to contain bacteria. They were found to contain carbon. And these were protected inside of these rocks. And we also know that bacteria can survive long time in hibernation. We know that Mars was safer than Earth. We know that Mars was not as hot at, as Earth. And we also know that Mars have had oxygen back then when Earth did not. So all these evidence points to the fact that this theory of panspermia could have some level of truth. This diagram has been proposed and is just showing that these meteorites that were coming from exoplanets could have reached our Earth and they were shown to contain all these molecules that possibly shows that life actually existed on them and could have been driven onto our Earth. The next theory is that of that called the spontaneous generation theory, which says that life may have arisen a biologically, which means that life could have started from non-living things. And there are some details that are proponents to this. For example, Aristotle suggested that when you take soil, straw, or refuse that was free of life, and you leave it for a long time, living organisms begin to emerge out of it. And we have the scientist Van Vermoort who supported this. Now think about this. If I keep refuse in my home for a long time and I see my God, all those things coming out from it, could that mean that it is the refuse that are turned into the maggots? We will seek to explain that a bit more later. But uh, there were some other scientists who didn't agree. So, for example, Francesco Ridi uh, did some work and showed that it wasn't true. And following the discovery of the microscope by Van Leeuwenhoek in, 19, in 1675, we paved the way to actually prove that indeed the theory of spontaneous generation cannot be true. And various experiments were done to prove that the corners was not true. Beginning with Needham and Buffon, they did a, uh, a mutton broth heating test. So they take the broth, that is a liquid oozing out from meat, and they heated it. The temperature at which they heated and other conditions wasn't actually of their concern, but they only said they heated it, and they saw that it could support life. But later on, Spallanzani detected that there were loopholes in the experiment these guys did. And it's true, because if you're not reporting the temperature, you're not reporting the conditions of heating, the pressure of heating and other conditions, you cannot tell me that you did enough heating and still life was able to be supported. So our good friend Louis Pasteur, the guy who discovered pasteurization, sterilization, gave the last blow to this theory when he performed his various heating experiment by stating the temperature at which the heating was done, the pressure at which the, the heating was done, and showed that this theory of long term, this theory of spontaneous generation could not have been true. So this is what he did. Based on Francesco uh, Ridi's experiment, he took jars and subjected them to different environmental conditions. One, he took a jar with meat inside and opened it to insects. So it was possible that the insect could go with the meat. They lay eggs, which could be the beginning of life forms. And over time, these eggs hatched. And they generated maggot. And of course, if you know, if you remember uh, metamorphosis, these uh, maggots could become new flies. He repeated this experiment again, this time using uh, a permeable sealant. And he still saw organisms growing in the meat. And this could be explained that these flies could have laid their eggs, and over time, the eggs could have fallen onto the meat, right conditions, and they would generate maggot. But when he did the same experiment with a sealed container, which had or which gave no way for these flies to come in or lay their eggs, 
no maggots were generated. And this explains that the life was originating from a pre-existing life form, which may be coming from the eggs laid by the flies. Louis Pasteur also did a similar experiment, where he subjected broth to different heating conditions and pressure. And he observed that once you heated it at a certain point, right temperature, which we know as 121 degrees Celsius, with um, high pressure, every living form, which may have been the X of these flies, would have died. And the solution will stay sterile. And this has become the basis of pasteurization, the base of sterilization, which we still use now. So it wasn't possible that life could have generated from life forms within this short period of time. So this led scientists to propose a modification of the spontaneous theory called the long-term spontaneous generation theory. Long-term. And this was actually proposed by two biochemists, uh, Haldane and Oparin. And they suggested that life could have evolved from non-living things, but over a very long period of time, hence the name long-term spontaneous generation. So he said that in the period for chemical evolution, raw materials present on the primitive earth were used to synthesize monomers, which probably came together to form the macromolecules of life. And over time, membranes were developed, and that became the starting point for the perpetuation of life. And he said that what we needed at that time was a, li a large source of energy that was coming from the sun. And there could be other energy forms coming from electrical discharges that were coming from lightning. So he says that if over a long period of time you can have smaller molecules forming, these molecules could have come together with the right energy to form macromolecules. And over time, there could be aggregation of these macromolecules, formation of membranes, and having the first life form generated. So from this point onwards, we're going to spend time to look at experiments performed to really prove that this theory of long-term spontaneous generation theory could be true. So the major starting materials were coming from the atmosphere, and they were found to contain simple molecules like hydrogen, like methane, there was water vapor, ammonia, and there was even some hydrogen sulfide. And we also know that the earth's crust also contains some metallic sulfide and mineral phosphate. So all these could come together to form the initial molecules of life. Scientists have shown that uh, some carbonaceous meteorites actually contain organic molecules like alcohols, like pyrenes and pyrimidines. Some meteorites have been shown to contain clay. So it was possible that in these, the arrival of these molecules from, like we mentioned earlier on, from Mars or from other exoplanets could have brought these materials onto our Earth's surface. And that became the starting point for the formation of these biomolecules. So now let's zoom on to discuss and see the difference between chemical and biological evolution. And like I did say, we are interested in the chemical evolution because that led to the, the derivation of the very first life form. Then from that point onwards, biological evolution set in so that the beginning life forms, the primitive life forms, will now evolve to give other life forms that were more adapted to make use of the conditions that were available then. So chemical evolution refers to the formation of these complex organic molecules from simple ones. Whereas biological evolution involved formation of a sustaining, self-replicating system from very complex organic molecules that were produced from the chemical evolution. And we can identify the following steps in both. One, there's a formation of biologically important mono monomers like sugars, like amino acids, and this could have come from very simple molecules like methane, ammonia, and water. So in the primitive atmosphere, if these smaller molecules, methane, ammonia, water, and others were present, it is possible that they could have come together to form the biologically important monomers like the sugars. And this would be followed by the polymerization of the monomers into biopolymers like the proteins and nucleic acids. Then over time, there's aggregation of these bio uh, biopolymers into forming prototypes of cells. Then the biological evolution sets in where there's a development of a complex reproductive system and other systems 
that made use of the conditions that were present there. So a combination of both the chemical and biological evolution to the theory of long-term spontaneous generation could have explained the possibility of the evolution of life from non-living things, but over a long period of time. So let's basically talk about the pre-modal soup or the prebiotic soup. And uh, this is just to mention the fact that billions of years uh, ago, we could have most of these smaller molecules we are talking about being washed by rain into the ocean. So the ocean was seen as having a mixture of so many things, including the building blocks of proteins, carbohydrates, and all that existed in that liquid system. And hence, we are calling it the prebiotic soup. Now, in this theory, we are saying that the basic building blocks of life may, come, may have come from simple molecules formed in the atmosphere. And when these were energized by lightning and rain from the atmosphere, it created this organic soup, and that brought these molecules together. Scientists have performed experiments like Stanley uh, and Urey that did an experiment in 1950 to test this theory, and they were able to mix uh, gases, different gases, methane, ammonia, water, hydrogen, there was no oxygen. And they saw that when they were exposed to the right amount of energy in the form of heat, in the form of UV or electricity, these smaller molecules came together and they formed the building blocks of these uh, biomolecules. The building blocks of these biomolecules. So we discussed the experiment by Miller. Uh, Miller in the 1950s, and he tried to mimic a primitive atmosphere where these gases were present, where there was a lot of energy, and there was a possibility of these smaller molecules coming together to form the macromolecules. So he has this gas, a glass system containing the mixture of these gases. There could be ammonia, there could be methane, there could be water vapor, and others all here. And the energy source where these electrodes connected to electricity source where they're generating high energy sparks and these spark discharges was able to get these molecules to fuse together in different proportions to yield the different macro molecules so the uh, over time the products from these gases were accumulated here and scientists were able to test and they observed that within these organic compounds trapped here there was the possibility, and they actually detected amino acids, they detected basic sugars from the mixture of gases that were initially energized by this uh, electrical discharge source. So it is the possibility that in the primitive atmosphere, when all these smaller molecules were present with a large amount of energy from the sun, from electrical discharges of the lightning, these molecules could have come together to form the macromolecules of life and generated these organic molecules. So one reaction has been proposed called the foremost reaction. And this reaction just says that if I begin with formaldehyde, with one carbon, two hydrogens, one oxygen, which is actually the, uh, what do you call it, the, uh, the, um, the basic unit of carbohydrate, it was possible that with the right temperature, these molecules would have been coming together to form a two-carbon molecule, to form three-carbon molecules. And these two uh, molecules, for example, we know already, or we'll come to learn about them later. This is glyceraldehyde and dihydroxyacetone. These molecules could have come together in other proportions to generate four-carbon, five-carbon, and six-carbon sugars, which could have been the monomer unit for the formation of carbohydrates. The Schrecker synthesis has also been proposed, and this says that if I begin with any aldehyde and with the abundance of ammonia, which either could exist as ammonium chloride or potassium cyanide or cyanate, which contains this nitrogen, then they could have also come together in other proportions to form different amino acids. And of course, we know that amino acids become the building blocks for the formation of proteins. Another synthesis has also been proposed for a possible formation of nucleotides. 
basically called the polymerization of uh, cyanide, in this case, hydrogen cyanide. So scientists believe, and they have proposed this reaction to suggest that in the primitive atmosphere, it was possible that hydrogen cyanide could have come together in several proportions, first to form the diamino, uh, maleodinitrile, which could have, with the right energy, fused with other hydrogen cyanide molecules to generate adenine, which is a, a, a nucleotide base, to generate guanine, to generate xanthin, hypoxanthin, and generated all the other possible uh, uh, bases, both pyrene and pyrimidine bases, that could have formed the bases of uh, nucleic acids. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's possible that in the theory of long-term spontaneous generation, we could have generated these basic molecules of life, which would have gone through the next process of polymerization, the next other process of aggregation to form the very first prototype of a living cell. What about fatty acids? Science have also postulated that with a high temperature and high uh, hydrogen pressure, it was possible that fatty acids could have also been formed in the primitive uh, atmosphere. Now, the primitive atmosphere was also described as reducing because uh, at the beginning of life, because there were no life forms to generate or to use oxygen, there were no oxygen on the atmosphere. There was no need for the ozone layer to block UV radiations, which could ignite oxygen on our atmosphere. And matter from which uh, the earth was formed was mostly hydrogen, which is a good reductant, and therefore making our atmosphere being described as what? Reducing. Meteorites were also found to contain iron. Iron can both uh, can take electrons, can give electrons, and therefore could be described as a reducing agent. And carbon was also present in these atmospheres. So it was possible and definitely affirms the fact that our primitive atmosphere could be described as reducing. So what we have discussed up to this point through the theory of long-term spontaneous generation is that with the abundance of the smaller unit molecules, and high temperature and energy, it was possible that these smaller molecules would have come together to form the monomers. And here I'm talking about sugars, bases, or what you call nucleotide bases, amino acids, and also fatty acids. So the next step in explaining the long-term theory is to show how possible it was for these monomer units to come together to form the polymers, like the carbohydrate, like nucleic acids, like lipids, like uh, proteins to make a uh, perpetuation of life possible from them. So we know polymerization simply means the coming together of smaller molecules to form larger ones. And through such processes, we can form polypeptides, polynucleotides, and the rest. So for example, if I take two glucose molecules, through the process of condensation, I will take one molecule of water out, and two glucose can be brought together to form a disaccharide. But the begging question is this. If you look at the Ford reaction, condensation was occurring. But the re reverse direct, uh, direction is hydrolysis. And it was possible because water was present in this primitive atmosphere. So there should be a way of taking out the water so that the Ford reaction can occur without necessarily reversing. And therefore, we needed condensation agent. And that made it possible. And so this, is the for me, um, this was possible because we have to form high energy intermediates so that it shifts the equilibrium to the right, favoring the formation of the polymer. Therefore, uh, scientists did some experiment and observed that yes, this was possible in the primitive atmosphere because some energetic double bonds, bond lead molecule were present. Example being the carbodimide uh, with this general formula and specific examples that were present in the prebiotic soup, including cyanogen, including cyanamide, there was also cyanoacetylene, and all these could have served as condensation agent, meaning that they would have formed complexes with one of the molecules. The second molecule to form the, the polymer comes. It joins with the first molecule bound to the energy, uh, the energized molecule bound to the condensation agent, and the condensation agent goes away with the water, so that the fuel reaction is favored. It must be emphasized that even in our current biological systems, this is how reactions were okay, are occurring with the use of condensation agents, and one of them being ATP, adenosine triphosphate. 
So in the glycogen pathway, in the uh, synthesis of glycogen, we always find a form of ATP called UTP that binds with the glucose, making it energized so that when the second glucose comes in, a bond is formed and this UDP leaves with the water so that the forward reaction is always favored. So let's talk about polypeptides and polynucleotides and various studies have gone on with these two uh, molecules. Uh, polymerization per se might not have been the problem, but the real problem was the competition for water molecules in this coupling reaction. So one way of doing this uh, uh, is to remove the water, and like we have mentioned, these molecules was possible uh, to have done that. But another way of achieving this was to heat to dryness, and of course, we know that prolonged heating can lead to the destruction of these polypeptides and polynucleotides. So the most effective way of uh, doing this uh, was concentrating these prebiological molecules uh, by absorbing them onto surfaces like minerals, like mica, like clay, and kaolin. So these surfaces act as a matrix upon which the first molecule binds, then the others come to join. And when it is ready, they leave the, the system. So they could have been both non-structured or template directed synthesis of these polypeptides and polynucleotides. So when we are talking about the non-instructed, we are talking about two polymers achieved by drying or by the use of a condensing uh, condensation agent. But the most postulated one is the template driven where polypeptides can be divided into two categories, those um, synthesis where the amino acids are activated using a template or synthesis that is directed by a nucleic acid template. And we later on appreciate that currently, as we know, for protein synthesis, the DNA becomes a messenger RNA, and that becomes a template upon which an amino acid is joined to other amino acids to form the proteins. Uh, this will be discussed, I'm sure, later on. Getting to the end of this lecture, we want to also understand of the proteins and nucleic acid, which was, which is more uh, primitive. That is to say that which was synthesized first. Did you produce the proteins first, or did you produce the nucleic acids first? It's like asking this question: the egg and the chicken. Which one was created first? Was the egg created first to hatch to become a chicken? Or was the chicken created first to lay eggs to become other chicken? So it's difficult to understand or to explain which, but the most plausible is to say that both of them evolved together. Why do we say so? Because proteins are known to have both structural and catalytic function. And in our other lectures, we talk about the functions of proteins. So it was possible that proteins have to catalyze the synthesis of nucleic acids. And we also know that nucleic acids have the information for the synthesis of proteins. And evidence has shown that there are some nucleic acids that have enzyme function, right? Or they have coenzyme function and therefore aid in the catalytic process of these enzymes. So like I said, the more plausible reasoning is to say that both evolve at the same time. So the ability of this polynucleotide to replicate could be coupled with the ability of this polypeptide to also act as catalyst. So because the catalyst that is needed to promote the replication, the translation, the transcription, and these are terms I'm sure you've heard before and we will explain further later on the function of proteins. The discovery of the enzyme called ribosome, which is actually an RNA enzyme, added another dimension. And that dimension could have promoted or could have explained the possibility of having nucleotides evolving before actually proteins were evolved. Great. So what have we arrived so far? So far we've seen that it was possible to have formed the monomers. It was possible to have also formed the polymers. And now let's see if it was possible to bring these polymers together to form the prototype of cells, right? So we have learned before that a cell is that a compartment in which life is possible and usually surrounded by a membrane. And two scientists, Oprin and Fox, did different experiments. Oprin suggested that the first cells emerged 
when a membrane was formed around a set of molecules with catalytic uh, ability, preferably proteins. So if I have some proteins there and I'm able to put a membrane around it which could have formed or could have been formed from the lipids, then that could have generated the first type of cell. Um, and you call this first cell a probiont, and probiont were formed through the process called quasivation. So this phenomenon of quasivation uh, can take place in the aqueous system, and it involves the spontaneous separation of one phase of aqueous solution of a polymer into two phases, where we can have one phase having high polymer concentration and the other having a low concentration. So the, do the droplets could have interacted with the aqueous environment and that could acquire com compounds in which these droplets can grow. And this is, or this has been explained on the basis of what you call micelles. Now, if you put any fatty acid or lipid in water, we know that lipids have, or we are going to learn later on, that lipids have a polar head and an unpolar tail. And lipids tend to interact with themselves such that the polar heads will stick together and then the polar tails will stick together. So this is the beginning of micelle. Once I have a micelle this way where the polar heads are outside and then the polar tails are inside, we can have two micelles interacting with themselves where the polar heads will be on the outside and the inner layer and the non-polar tails will be existing between the two polar heads. So this can be seen as a cell because we have a membrane. We are going to later on learn that a membrane is actually a lipid bilayer. So if I have this outer layer and the inner layer, then that made a membrane. It's also possible that when I have two of these layers forming a membrane, it's possible that this membrane could also split to get two smaller membranes. And that is can be called a vesicle. Now, in the formation of a cell, it is also possible that if this formation of bilayer occurs, they could have captured another molecule inside. In this case, I'm just demonstrating with a protein. And protein can have a catalytic function. They could have included some minerals. They could have included some nucleic acids. And all this process can lead to the formation of the first type of cell, which we are calling the protocell. Right. So it makes sense that along the theory of long-term spontaneous generation, we could have formed the macromolecules or the individual molecules. We could have polymerized them to form the macromolecules. Then there was a possibility of the formation of a membrane around it and the inclusion of a catalytic function or a nucleic acid function, some minerals and some nutrients, and that would have begun the cell. Indeed, experiments have been done, and under electron microscope, it has been shown that this theory proposed by Oprin and Fox could be a possibility for the formation of the first type of cells in the primitive atmosphere. There were a few shortcomings, of course, for every experiment, uh, but we now know that this could have been used as a possible way of forming the very first types of cells. So uh, the final point is biological evolution. So the chemical evolution have formed the first type of cell. But through the process of biological evolution, it's now possible. And now we know that out of biological evolution, we have developed the metabolic pathways. And this became important when there was competition for nutrients. And as essential component in the prebiotic soup became scarce, organisms have to find ways of perpetuating by finding ways of properly and effectively making use of their energy sources. And that led to the, the development of these metabolic pathways. Another problem that arose was the generation of oxygen, right? When we were using water as a reducing agent, we were producing a lot of oxygen. So to circumvent this and to prevent oxidative damage, the ozone layer was developed uh, to serve as a protective uh, layer for our atmosphere. So, like I said, ozone layer was delayed and that served as a shield. Then from this point, in your lectures in biology, you then begin to talk about proper biological evolution, where a primitive life like the prokaryote, which may lack membranes, became eukaryotes, that's where membrane mound, uh, like the pro uh, proctotist, 
And then they developed other eukaryotic forms like fungi, other eukaryotic forms like plants, other eukaryotic forms like the animal cell, and then reproductive pathways were developed. Um, mutation was developed. And to go back to explain our very first definition of life, where we said that life should be capable of self-sustenance, it should be capable of replication, and should be capable of uh, some level of mutation to ensure uh, that they develop mechanisms that could survive uh, the uh, changing conditions in the environment. Thank you.